Hello and welcome to Socialism, the Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. I do just want to open with just two words. At last. Finally, it's called, we have a general election and we can fight to get the Tories out. This election is harder to call than perhaps any in British history. But what we can say is that whatever the outcome, tempestuous class struggle will follow. What is the best outcome for this general election? How can socialists help to achieve it? And what does the workers' movement need to be ready for after the 12th of December? This special episode of Socialism looks at Britain's 2019 general election. Tories out, Corbyn in with socialist policies. Socialists, trade unionists and young people from all across Britain and even some from across the world gathered in central London last weekend at the Socialism 2019 event to discuss all of the problems facing the working class today, including the general election in Britain. This special episode of Socialism will hear speeches from the Saturday Rally of Socialism 2019 discussing the tasks facing our movement in the winter election. Here's Socialist Party Deputy General Secretary, Anna Sell. Comrades, in the Communist Manifesto, published in another era of revolution, the then young authors, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, explained the job of people like us, of the socialists, the communists, the Marxists, and what they said was that we have to fight tenaciously for the attainment of the immediate aims for the momentary interests of the working class. But in the movement of the present, we also have to represent and take care of the future of that movement. You can find that quote, by the way, not only in the Communist Manifesto, but at the beginning of a very good new book, which is a report of a vital battle in defense of our ideas in which we have been involved in the last year. And that quote really sums up our role, the essence of what we do. But I think we have all experienced that 2019 up until now has not been the easiest time to play that role. Yes. We have been intervening in important strikes against low pay, casualisation, bullying bosses. We have taken part in the magnificent, predominantly young, mass protests against climate change. We are involved day to day in campaigning to scrap universal credit, to stop evictions, to stop the council cuts being carried out by both Labour and Tory councils. And we know, we've heard tonight, there have been victories in a whole number of those important local struggles. And with the magnificent CWU ballot result, the UCU ballot result, there is the prospect of more victories. And it is also true, it is our experience, that the dominant mood in society is a deep-seated anger against the existing order. There isn't time to describe everything that order means. But an order where now, for example, you can go into Waterstones or any mainstream bookshop and you can go to the preschool section and buy a book about why your mummy can't afford to eat breakfast and the trip to the food bank. So normal has semi-starvation of the poorest sections of the working class become. An order where you have the horror of Grenfell, the role of the private profiteers in the construction industry, the penny pinching of a Tory council, and yet they try and get away with blaming the firefighters. And there's anger against all of that and more. No different to the anger we are seeing on the streets in Chile, in the Lebanon, in Iraq, in other countries. But it hasn't had an outlet. 
And the dominant mood this year has really been, I would say, one of a kind of sullen anger, but lack of confidence that it's possible to change anything. For many workers, whether they voted leave or remain, the fog of Brexit is hanging over everything. It's clear to us that a step forward for the working class would be to get this Tory government out of office and for the election of a Corbyn-led government in the general election. We've been campaigning for that all year. If the trade union leaders had lifted their little fingers and fought for it, this weak, divided government would have been thrown out of office long ago. <laughs> Nonetheless, I think we have all experienced that many workers who agree with us on universal credit, who agree with us on Grenfell or the CWU strike, do not at the moment agree with us about the possibility or the positive character of a Corbyn-led government. And we understand that. We are not the kind of so-called socialists who blame the working class for being sceptical of a Corbyn-led government, who write them off as being racist or backward or any of the other arguments that get pulled forward by some on the left. We understand we live in a capitalist society where the capitalist politicians, including those in the Labour Party, and the capitalist media rain down insults and attacks on Corbyn, and that they are bound to have an effect, above all because of the failure of the left leadership of the Labour Party to effectively answer them. Other speakers have talked tonight about how we explained Corbyn's election did not transform Labour into a workers' party, but changed it, if you like, into two parties in one. To be a bit more precise, it changed Labour into two potential parties, a potential anti-austerity party around Jeremy Corbyn and then a pretty fully formed pro-capitalist party around the Blairites. And as we have warned at every stage, Corbyn and the Labour leadership strategy of attempting to pacify that capitalist wing of the Labour Party, to compromise with them, it's never going to work. Look at the vote for the general election. 11 Labour MPs voted against a general election. A hundred of them didn't bother to vote. And they say, oh, we forgot, or the whip told us the wrong thing and we didn't mean to. And maybe you could think that might be true. But then look at who they are. Look at that hundred. Margaret Hodge, Stella Creasy, Jess Phillips. The arch Blairites are determined to wreck Corbyn's chances of winning a general election and were showing it again in that vote that took place. It doesn't work when you're faced with false accusations that Corbyn has brought anti-Semitism into the Labour Party, to have a solution of bowing down, of suspending a left Labour MP, Chris Williamson, because he very, very politely said that maybe there were some lies being told about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. If you bow down, instead of standing up and answering those kind of lies, they are bound to take root. And we know in the run-up to this general election, there have been quite serious mistakes made by the left leadership of the Labour Party. Instead of fighting tooth and nail for a general election, they've been too much sucked in to parliamentary manoeuvres, which give the appearance of being part of a rebel alliance with the likes of Ken Clark, the man who was in every single Thatcher government, or with Joe Swinson, who took part in the Condemn Coalition, the most vicious pro-austerity government since the 1930s. And that has given credence amongst some workers that Johnson is standing up for the people against the elite in Parliament. Rubbish, of course, absolute and total rubbish but it has allowed the lie to get a certain echo. 
And those mistakes mean this is not the most favorable terrain for Corbyn to fight a general election. There's no question there are doubts among many workers, which at root, even if they're not expressed like this, are, if you can't even stand up to the capitalists in your own party, are you going to stand up and fight for our interests against the bosses in government? That is the kind of gut feeling that exists amongst big sections of the working class. But let's be clear, in 2017, in the snap election, Labour began on 25% in the polls, the same as they are today. They went on not to win, but to win an extra three and a half million votes. We argued at the time that if Corbyn came out fighting on a socialist programme, he could win the general election. And let's remember, nobody believed us. The Corbynites didn't believe us. Everybody thought we were heading for a Tory landslide. But the election proved otherwise. This is going to be a very unpredictable general election we're going into. And after all, all elections are only a photograph, a moment in time, in a moving picture of class struggle. But nonetheless, it is already clear the Tories are not going to get it all their own way in trying to make this an election that is just about Brexit. Johnson is already turning up in hospitals and being chased out by the staff, the patients and the visitors. And Corbyn's election launch was not the kind of mass rally he should have organised. But nonetheless, it was not a bad beginning in saying that there are 150 billionaires in the UK and 14 million people living in poverty and that he will fight for a society where there are neither billionaires nor people living in poverty, of pledging to scrap universal credit and end tuition fees, promising a £10 an hour minimum wage for all, regardless of age, and to nationalise mail, rail and energy. If he builds on that and puts a fighting socialist programme, like in 2017, there will be workers up and down the country who won't forget their scepticism of Corbyn, but will start to think, we have a chance of a government that might get me a council house, that might get me a decent wage, that might mean I don't have to work on a zero-hour contract anymore, and therefore it's worth coming out to support them. If Corbyn stands on a clear anti-austerity programme, combined with making clear that he is not standing for Remain, yes, he can put a deal to a confirmatory referendum, but he makes clear that he will fight for a Brexit in workers' interests and will put that to a referendum with his red lines, as we have explained, being no privatisation, no anti-worker laws, and all of the rest of it. If he takes that approach... We could have a Jeremy Corbyn-led government on the 12th of December. And in the Socialist Party, as we did in 2017, we will be out on the streets, in the workplaces, in the university campuses, fighting for the election of such a government. But we are the element of the future in the movement of the present. And it is not our job just to do that. We also have to prepare for what comes beyond the 12th of December. And of course, that includes the possibility that Johnson manages to wangle himself a small majority. So let's be clear on this. That would be an extremely weak government. A government coming to power against the background of a growing economic crisis. A government, as three cabinet ministers have written in a book, with the intention of turning Britain into Singapore on Thames. And what do they mean by that? We know what they mean, because they've put it in their Brexit deal. They mean the ripping up of the few workers' rights that we have, the opening up of the NHS to the US, private companies, and so on. They do that, though. They will face massive opposition. What we've seen in Brazil, the right-wing populist Bolsonaro thought he was a mighty powerful ruler, and then we saw a 47 million strong general strike against him within months of being elected. So 
So that is one possibility. But of course, another and what we will fight for is that Corbyn is able to win that election. And that will just be the beginning. Why do we always raise the necessity of the nationalisation of the commanding heights of the economy, the major corporations and the banks? We raise it because we understand, modest as Corbyn's programme is, the capitalist class would not sit back and allow him to implement it. They would do everything within their power to sabotage a Corbyn-led government. And therefore, we know many workers will think what you're raising goes too far. It's utopian. But we understand the only way, the only practical way to really build a society for the many, not the few, is to take the commanding heights of the economy into democratic public ownership and to break the power of the capitalist class. Now, Corbyn's program is quite modest by historical standards, but I don't think we should underestimate how far it still terrifies the capitalist class. Read their papers this week. City AM, the free newspaper for city workers, had an editorial about how Corbyn is launching a vicious class war against them and then going on for plans of how to get their money out of the country. Why are they so terrified? Well, there's two reasons. The first is they don't want to give up a penny. No matter how much is modest his programme, they don't want the working class to gain anything. But there's a second and more fundamental reason. They're frightened that not Corbyn is launching a vicious class war, but the election of a government led by him could raise the confidence of the working class in this country to conduct a class war, unlike the one we've got at the moment, where the rich are winning, where we win that class war. Now, it's true that a section of the bosses appear more relaxed about a Corbyn-led government this time. The Economist, for example, today has an article about it, saying maybe it wouldn't be that bad after all, some of the bosses are saying. There's two reasons they give. One is they really don't like Johnson's Brexit deal. It's not good for their profits. But the other reason is because they don't think Corbyn can win a majority. And therefore, any of his radical demands will not be implemented because he would be in coalition with the SNP and the Liberal Democrats. What does that show us? First of all, that Corbyn has to absolutely stick by the position that him and Macdonald have put so far, that they will not enter a coalition government. They will not govern together with capitalist parties. Does that mean we're saying that if Corbyn doesn't get a majority, he has to step back and just be the opposition if Labour comes out of this general election as the biggest party Absolutely not. He would have to take that platform, fight for his programme and call on the working class to back him. I would suggest that you all go back and read about the first Labour government, a minority Labour government in 1924. Not for what it did, but for what Leon Trotsky said it should have done. And I just want to give a quote. He says... It does not have a majority in government, but that does not mean the situation is totally hopeless. There is a way out. We only need to have the will to fight for it. What if McDonald's said we are going to nationalise the bloodsuckers' lands, mines and railways? With the resources released by the abolition of the monarchy, we are going to undertake the construction of housing for the workers. He says, Trotsky, in Britain, three quarters of the population is working class. If MacDonald walked into Parliament, laid his programme on the table, wrapped lightly with his knuckles, and said, accept it or I'll drive you all out, Trotsky then says he could say it more politely if he liked. If, if he did that, Britain would be unrecognisable in two weeks. MacDonald would win a majority in any election. Now that has an enormous relevance for today, not just because of the prospect of a Corbyn minority government, but also because, let's be clear, even if Labour wins a majority, 
it will be a minority government for the anti-austerity part of the Labour Party because they will be surrounded by pro-capitalist MPs. That does not mean accepting those constraints. We have to fight to use that platform to fight for a programme in the interests of the working class and to mobilise the working class in support of it. We have to prepare the trade union movement to fight for a program in the interests of the working class in the face of every hesitation and retreat that comes from the top. Now, standing here nearly six weeks before a general election, it is not possible to predict how events are going to develop. But we can say some things with certainty. We can say that if Corbyn comes out fighting, he will get an echo from the working class and from sections of the middle class. We can say for certain that after a general election, whether he's won it or not, the capitalist class are going to do everything they can to sabotage his programme, and if he's lost, and they can, to get rid of him from the leadership of the Labour Party. And we can say with absolute certainty that the working class in Britain and internationally remains the most powerful force, the only force, capable of fighting for the fundamental transformation of society. It gets confirmed from unusual sources. A couple of weeks ago, the US paper, the Washington Post, produced a survey of 100 years of 150 revolutions and revolts. And they'd gone into them all, and they'd studied them. And this was their only conclusion, the thread that ran through it all. The difference between whether they won or whether they lost was whether the working class was actively involved. And they're absolutely right. And the final thing that I will say, we can say with certainty, is that the Socialist Party, as will our comrades around the world in the CWI, will go from this hall today and we will fight tenaciously to build a mass revolutionary party, a party that fights for every immediate step forward for the working class, as we did in Liverpool and we do every day, but also always put central the need for the overthrow of capitalism and the socialist transformation of society in order to build a new democratic order that can meet the needs of all humanity. The crisis of the political parties in Britain raises questions about how socialists and workers should organise to achieve their aims. And these questions are not limited to Britain. In fact, there is a wave of revolt and revolution spreading across the entire planet. Here are some excerpts from the speech of Socialist Party General Secretary Peter Taff on the need for working class political organisation and the rebellions spreading across the planet. The world, including Britain, is in the midst of turmoil. Like the European continental revolutions in 1848, but also with a touch of the Russian Revolution of 1917, an angry wave of revolutionary movements, because that's what they are, involving a new, fresh generation, have spread like a prairie fire leaping from one country to another. What is this but Trotsky's theory of the permanent revolution? So explosive and intertwined are the developments in each country that it would take a break in one country to provoke an international movement of the working class. And notwithstanding the general election, that's been announced by Johnson, the same process is about to take place in Britain. Puffed up like a bullfrog, he's trying to perpetuate a colossal fraud on the British people. Austerity is over. They're now going to splash the cash. If you believe that, you believe any fairy tale. Johnson and the rest of the rich boy Eton mafia are responsible for the most brutal attacks on the living standards of working people since the Baldwin government of the 1920s that provoked the 1926 general strike. And it's an indictment of the leadership, the official leadership of the labor movement, that they've not been sent packing 
by the trade union leaders and by the labour movement as a whole. Will capitalism and their representatives like Trump are a modern manifestation of the mad, blood-soaked Caesars of ancient Rome like Caligula. And Johnson is just a homegrown poundland Trump. This uprising is truly a world process. It raises the necessity of a world socialist revolution in Latin America, Chile, Bolivia, Ecuador are on the move. What country in Latin America has not moved in the recent period? In the Lebanon, previously a byword for sectarian division, the revolution has been driven by young people and the working class. They're flying the national flag because it's not seen as sectarian. But that's merely a step towards the workers of Lebanon embracing a red flag. They are now seeking to adopt the traditional methods of the working class of struggle, of strikes, of solidarity, rejecting religious sectarian and symbols for a magnificent unity and action of the working class. Increasingly, the same is happening in Iraq of all places after the bloody experience of the Iraqi workers and peasants. The Kurds have been abandoned, as we predicted, by Trump and by American imperialism. And we say to our Kurdish brothers and sisters, don't rely on any of the exploiters. Rely on your own strength. And the world working class is the only force that can guarantee you your demands and your granting of your legitimate national rights. <laughs> it was the youth who were to the fore in the Arab Spring of 2011. They are now grappling with the problems of organization and leadership, which was absent in 2011 and accounted for the temporary defeat of the revolution. This is a precondition for those workers to be victorious in the next period itself. The only reason they've not succeeded already is a lack of organization and a lack of consciousness. In the next period, they will build independent organizations of the working class. Look at the Hong Kong youth. How marvelous it is that they've struggled so tenaciously against the rotted Chinese regime. And all they're asking is for democracy. Well, we say you'll only gain that with creating a revolutionary constituent assembly which can change the society in Hong Kong and appeal to the masses in China itself. Many of these young workers carry their own wills in their pockets because they expect to be shot on the streets of Hong Kong. That's an indication of the marvelous spirit that exists. This broad movement is a herald of a new Arab Spring, except it will develop into an Arab summer in the next period. We fully expected that a movement would take place, but none of us could have anticipated the speed and the scale of this movement as it's developing. Make no mistake about it, this is one of those moments, a eureka moment in history, when the scales drop from the eyes of the working class and the youth and sections of the middle class, and they cast around for an organization and a leadership that can show a way forward. Not just a change in consciousness is taking place, but leaps in understanding. And we say to the capitalists, you've had your day. You are incapable of managing the world economic and social situation. You cannot even grant a piece of bread to the starving millions throughout the world. You've enormously worsened through your own planned system the environmental and economic catastrophe of climate change which provoked the young and the marvelous movement worldwide to rise up against you and your rotted system. And this is just the beginning. And we are with the youth on this movement linked to a change, a system change in capitalism itself. You have presided over a failed economic and social system. And throughout the world, the working class and sections of the middle class are rising against you. There's a crisis of the system, and this is related to what's likely the drama that's likely to develop in Britain in the next period. And the central question is, 
How can Corbyn win in this general election? There's enormous skepticism, including in this hall, I suspect, that Corbyn, through his zigzags, along with John MacDonald, has introduced a very confused period and contradiction in the consciousness of the people. But look at the tremendous speech that he made at the beginning of this election, where he indicted not just capitalism, but what has become a plutocracy and of all the other horrors of capitalism. In fact, if he would have had a left serious organization in the Labour Party, the Labour right would have been crushed by now. But unfortunately, momentum dithered, hesitated. We had discussions with them about joining the Labour Party and joining momentum, and we were turned down. And what's been the result? The right of run riot. Corbyn should seize the opportunity to clear the right out of the Labour Party. We applied openly to join the Labour Party with the same rights as every other organisation, with our own organisational journals and so on. After all, this was the model upon which the Labour Party was formed in the first place as a federation of trends and tendencies, without even the stipulation in the first instance that they should be socialist at the outset. This will be a form of organisation that willy-nilly will be adopted within the Labour Party because a split is coming in relation to the right and the left. They cannot coexist together. We've said there's two or three parties in the Labour Party. How long can we continue with these saboteurs in the Labour Party? The election will represent a dividing line between the past and the new situation that will open up in Britain. This is the music of the future, the music of socialism. Exciting times lie ahead, and capitalism cannot solve the problems of working people. We intend to seize every opportunity to build our forces forward to the building of a mass workers' party as part of the reorganization and the regeneration of the mass movement in Britain. On that basis, we'd be able to create a democratic and socialist world. That's what this meeting today is all about, of a democratic and socialist Britain leading to a united socialist states of Europe and a united socialist federation of the world. This is not utopian, it's a practical objective grounded in the reality of a failing system and of the working people on the move. Go to it, join our ranks, join with the wave of the future. You can hear Peter's speech in full at the Socialist Party YouTube channel. The trade unions, the basic organisations of the working class, have an extremely important role to play, not only in this election campaign, but in the battles which are going to open up afterwards, as we've heard so far this episode. Here's Marion Lloyd, a Socialist Party member, who is standing to be General Secretary, the day-to-day -day leader of the 185,000 strong civil service union, PCS, on why Socialist leadership is essential for the trade unions in this period. This election comes at a crucial time for PCS members and the working class. The ruling class are split and in crisis. We have lived through years of austerity, seeing our standards of living absolutely devastated. And now at last, after weeks of dithering, we've got a general election and the possibility of electing a Corbyn-led government on an anti austerity programme. And we must be in no doubt that if that happens, of course, that will be a great breakthrough. But it is in this context that it is crucial to have a General Secretary that understands the political situation under which we live and the role of the trade union in that context. Because we know and we understand that nothing is straightforward. Even if a Corbyn government is elected, and even if the Labour Party were united, we know that the capitalist establishment will do everything in its power that can try to stop him. But we also understand 
and we need to have general secretaries and leaders that state life as it absolutely is. And we know that the Labour Party is two parties in one. In the left corner, we've got socialists. And in the right corner, we've got pro-business, pro-austerity, people who will stop at nothing to stop Corbyn and also remove him if they so wish. And let's not forget that many of these Blairites, they voted for the cuts and the closures and the pay freeze that our members are suffering from. We do not need cheerleaders for the Labour Party. We are a trade union, not a campaigning group or an arm of the Labour Party. We give them no blank check. We say to them, we want you to implement the policies of our union. And if you don't, we will unite together and we will struggle. And we need to be absolutely clear that if it was a Labour government or any government of any colour, that the role of the trade union is to pressure them into conceding our demands. We want a Corbyn-led government. But this is because of his demands and his manifesto. Because those demands and that manifesto helps to solve the problems of PCS members. But if he doesn't implement what he says he's going to be, let's be clear. The role of leadership is to unite the working class around demands and make him do it. PCS members can wait no longer. One in ten civil servants earn less than the living wage. Thousands of workers in DWP and HMRC are claiming the benefits that they administer. Our job is to join up struggles. Our job is to give members the confidence that with the proper strategy and effective leadership, we can win. We must cut through the growing bureaucracy. We must reclaim the union and make it democratic and accountable. I will not take the General Secretary's wage. I have been active in this union for more than 40 years and I am not in it for my own personal gain. I have the confidence in our method and our approach, but also in the preparedness of our members and class to fight and win. We must learn. I have learnt all of my working life by being a member of the militant and now the Socialist Party that our struggle is to win the best candidates for our members on the best programme. But I understand as well that it's part of a wider struggle for socialist change. That is what we're here for and that is what we fight and we struggle for. Solidarity, comrades. Let's go out there and do what we can in this election. Thank you for listening. And you can hear more about what Marion says is necessary for PCS and the trade union movement in Britain in a future episode on building fighting democratic unions. As well as the organised working class, the Socialist Party has always focused its energies on the youth. Young people in Britain today, and indeed around the world, face a future of horror on the basis of the continuation of capitalism. Here's Socialist Party youth and student organiser Theo Sharif on what Socialist Students and the Socialist Party is doing to further the interests of young people in this election campaign. What language does capitalism speak to the millions of students and young workers living in Britain today? What kind of world are the young people in this hall on track to inherit on the basis of yet another Tory government being returned to number 10 this winter? All your life, work for your boss, work for your landlord, work for your right to live, and work until you're dead. And the Tories, by the way, are far from being satisfied with making students pay thousands of pounds a year for their education. Already, the ground has been prepared for a new raft of attacks, which could potentially provoke a new, fresh revolt over the question of free education. Essentially, it amounts to a plan to shackle even lower-paid graduates in a lifetime's worth of debt. But young people know instinctively that something is deeply wrong with the way that our society is organised on the basis of capitalism. Since we met in this hall this time last year, we've witnessed an almost spontaneous explosion of students when tens of thousands of school college students moved into action on the monthly climate strikes. Walkouts which demanded system change to end climate change 
But also the demands of a layer of students on those marches and walkouts were much more ambitious. They demanded action over austerity in schools, for a fully funded NHS, for votes at 16. Young people are struggling for a future worth living. And it's the same the world over, from Chile to Lebanon to Iraq. The children of the financial crash are moving into action and are taking to the streets. The Socialist Party and Socialist students have fought vociferously within the climate strike movement to win a new generation of activists to the ideas of socialism and Marxism. And on the campuses, Socialist Students is the only national organization which points students clearly in the direction of revolutionary ideas. We're ready to launch a socialist voter registration drive on the campuses linked to the fight for a Corbyn-led government with a socialist program. We're ready to campaign, demonstrate and occupy for all of these policies and more. We're ready to organize joint students and workers meetings on the campuses with CWU and UCU workers who, as we speak, are preparing to take strike action in the face of a crumbling Tory government. These are all aspects, by the way, of our socialist general election campaign, which we're going to be running on campuses. We'll be discussing at the Socialist Students National Conference in Birmingham on the 30th of November. What we won't be preparing to do is doorknock and campaign for Blairite right-wing Labour candidates. People who, for now, are happy to drape themselves in the popularity of Corbyn's leadership, but tomorrow will try their best to sink the knife in to his back if he makes it into Downing Street. <laughs> Which is why Corbyn's election will only be the beginning of a much more intense battle. A battle not just to defend his programme, from pro-capitalist sabotage, but potentially the opening up of a life and death struggle for the system of capitalism itself. That's what we want to build. And to achieve that, we're going to build a powerful student movement, fused with the even more powerful workers' movement, armed with a socialist program, to get rid of the Tories and get rid of them once and for all. To build a movement which will abolish capitalism and for the new generation, translate socialism into the language of jobs, homes, services, free education, and a future worth living. We're headed for a very hot winter in 2019. The University and College Union has just won a national strike ballot for lecturers and university staff to come out. The RMT Union, representing transport workers on South Western Railway, is planning a strike of 27 days over the Christmas period. Branches of McDonald's are due to come out in South London. And the big battle, as we've mentioned in previous episodes, is that of the Royal Mail and Parcel Force workers organised by the Communication Workers Union, the CWU. This could be an historic strike. And Socialism 2019, heard from Socialist Party Scotland member and Communication Workers Union branch secretary for the CWU Scotland No. 2 branch, Gary Clark, on the importance of this battle, the incredible vote for strike action, and the necessity of socialists and trade unionists across the country coming to its defence. Comrades, brothers and sisters, I think we're standing on a brink of a major industrial dispute which we've not seen in Britain for a number of years. We've just seen the result of 97% yes vote in the Royal Mail Group and 95% yes vote in Parcel Force Group with a 76% turnout which smashed all the anti-trade union laws, smellerines, and put... <laughs> but I tell you what, the mood is so strong in the workplace right now, we've got activists which were disappointed with that result. That's how strong the mood is. So what we're fighting for here is 40,000 jobs and a public service, which people want. They've brought in a horrible anti-trade union manager to take us on. But it's taken on 115,000 angry posties and be better prepared for a fight here. <laughs> they wrote to us on Tuesday this week asking for urgent negotiations and they put four hours aside for that. With no strings, they said. Well, they said, we won't discuss partial force and you must take strike action off the table until the new year. It was the same day as the general election was called. So I strongly believe Boris Johnson has tapped on the wing and said, I don't want any fights on the streets, I don't want any strikes when the general election's on. 
because that will make the class action and the forefront of the general election, and he does not want that. And make it clear, <laughs> is this, we will take strike action during the general election. We are now facing the battle. We need every individual in this room. Get around, visit your room, your workplaces. Get involved in support groups. We are in for a fight to the finish. We need to support every single trade union and socialist in this country. And our class enemies have picked up on this information. A reporter for the vicious right-wing tabloid The Daily Mail was in the opening rally of Socialism 2019 on Saturday the 2nd of November and has run an article attacking Gary Clark for his comments, making all sorts of mistakes of fact, as is traditional for the gutter press, but most importantly in running this attack piece, recognising the threat that the organised working class represents to Tory government and the rule of the capitalists. <laughs> This has just been a taster of some of the rich discussion and debate which took place over the weekend at Socialism 2019. So the fight is on. Let's kick the Tories out. Let's get an anti-austerity government into number 10. Let's push for it to adopt socialist policies and let's prepare to mobilise through the trade unions, on the university and school campuses and on the streets to launch the kind of movement which is necessary to reverse austerity and start the process of ending capitalism in Britain and across the planet once and for all. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for a Workers International. This week we heard Hannah Sell speaking at Socialism 2019, along with excerpts from speeches by Peter Taff, Marion Lloyd, Theo Sharif and Gary Clark, and I'm James Ivans. Help us spread the word by giving us a five-star review and subscribing so you don't miss out. Don't forget to recommend us to your co-workers and friends. We want you to send us recordings from picket lines and campaigns and reports of your activity. And we want your questions, comments and ideas for future episodes. Email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk Socialism the podcast has no wealthy backers. We survive thanks to the financial support of ordinary working class and young people, and we're proud of the political independence that gives us. If you like what you hear, help us take the fight to big business and the Tories. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. If you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for, we need you. Join our fight for a winning strategy in the Labour and Trade Union movement. Join the Socialist Party now. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. And if you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for a Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. Till next time, solidarity. Solidarity.